Hello! In this video I will try to present the history of the M1 tank series Armor Evolution. Video will be based on the declassified documents, public domain sources, but also photographic evidence and some of my own research into this subject. Ok, so let's talk about history first. Most of us probably heard a code name Chobam or Chobam Armor. Well, actually such thing does not exist officially in the classified British documents. What does exist actually is a code name Burlington. However, this is not a code name for a specific armor type. It's a code name for research and development program. And within this program, several different types of special armor were developed and tested. These special armors never had any fancy code names. They were only referred to in a rather enigmatic way as special armor number one, special armor number two, or biscuit number one, biscuit number two, etc. Obviously, the British were interested in selling their, uh, in, uh, their inventions for profits to various countries and were able to interest among many also United States of the America. The US obviously had their own programs for special armors, however in the end they considered the British design as most promising, acquiring full documentation and started their own research and development program, codenamed Starflower. So what are these Burlington and Starflower, uh, Starflower armors? Let's move to the next slide. Well, from seen here, the classified uh, CIA documents, we can conclude only one thing. It was NIRA, or non-energetic reactive armor. NIRA is made from multiple layers. Each layer in itself is layered. The smaller layers are made from two steel plates with some sort of reactive element between them. In most simple form of NIRA, it's made from steel with rubber in between. But the more advanced materials can be used, like various polymers that are more energetic than uh, rubber, and for example, steel plates of greater hardness, thus improving protection capabilities of the armor. British documents explicitly state that such type of armor can be tuned accordingly to perceived threats. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, another declassified document. If you want to read the entire page, stop the video. However, let, let's just uh, take a look at the most interesting part. Here it is directly stated that one variant of the M1 tank turret, which we can assume is the series production turret, offers equivalent of 750mm of rolled homogeneous armor against chemical energy munitions. This means munitions with shaped charge warheads. And it offers equivalent of 400 mm of rolled homogeneous armor against kinetic energy projectiles. This means that the original M1 during its production period, which is from 97, uh, 1979 to 1984-1985, had the best chemical energy protection on the turret front from all tanks that were in service back then. Uh, this is for example confirmed by the British documents concerning ballistic tests of the Leopard 2 tank, which I hope, hopefully I will describe in another video. And had comparable kinetic energy protection to other top tanks of that period, which is a quite good, good result. Also keep in mind that hull front should offer similar protection to the turret front in case of the M1 tank that was designed to have equal front protection for the turret and hull at, the at that time. Of course, we should all keep in mind that these declassified documents might be a disinformation spread on purpose. So, you know, everything needs to be taken uh, with a grain of salt. Okay. The Ballistic Research Laboratory, today known as Army Research Laboratory, as far as we know, developed two test armor arrays, known as 
BRL1 and BRL2. We can assume that the, perhaps BRL1 was equivalent to the armor package used in the original M1 tank, while BRL2 was improved heavier variant for M1 IP, IP for improved performance. There is also a controversial, uh, controversial subject or rather question, was BRL2 also used in the M1A1 tank? Or perhaps it was even newer and more improved armor package. Of course, we do not have any conclusive, conclusive evidence and we can only speculate. We know that US was working on ballistic ceramics for vehicle armor applications. This, doc this document you see now obviously refers for, to the development of the reinforced turret roof ceramic armor for the M1A2 that was developed in the late 1980s. But we know US was experimenting with ceramics much earlier. We also know that the British were also experimenting with ceramics for tank armor. Let's move to the next slide. One important thing to note here. Uh, you can see here the M1 or M1 IP tank uh, in a museum in the US and take a note of the serial number uh, on the turret uh, side. So what this serial number means? Of course it's just a serial number. However, if a serial number does not end with a letter, for example U or M or E or A, this means that this tank uses BRL1 or BRL2 armor. Okay, next slide. Let's take a look at prototype of the M1A1 tank, designated as M1E1. As we can see on the turret front, there are steel plates welded to it. These steel plates are weight simulators so the weight of the old armor package plus weight of the steel plates acting as weight simulators is equal to the weight of the new armor package. We, we, we will see similar pattern in development of prototypes for newer variants. But also notice one additional plate. It is welded to the whole front plate. This is significant as it tells us that the whole front armor was also improved. It is often claimed by various, let's call them sources, that front hull armor was not improved. Yet here we can see a weight simulator plate welded to, to the hull front, cl clearly contradicting such claims. What is also important, we will see such plates also later on. Perhaps BRL2 development might have been consulted with the British and it was the first step to hybridize the armor. By hybridizing armor, I mean using Nira layers in front of the array and steel ceramic steel layers behind them. Thus, Nira would damage a rod, bend or even break into smaller pieces, a kinetic energy rod or shaped charge jet, and passive layers behind it would stop what is left from the rod or the jet. Such design, of course, can be further tuned through adjustment of reactive to passive layers ratio, uh, used materials, etc. However, I do not want to speculate about protection levels of that armor and all armor types that superseded it during further development and modernization of a tank. Such data is classified, I don't know anything about it, and anyone who claims that he does is either spreading a fantasy or such person broke OPSEC rules and is spreading classified information. On the other hand, I am also not interested in the estimations, as these are prone to be highly speculative and often not backed up by any hard data. In so let's jump into the mid to late 1980s. This is where development of the new armor package began. Again, this is new armor package uh, and at least in public domain does not have any official code name. But as the first tank using it was designated M1A1HA where HA stands for heavy armor, let's simply name it as heavy armor package. We know that there are three generations of this heavy armor package. 
So early production M1A1HA is produced from around 1987, 1988 to 1990 uses the first generation of the heavy armor package, or HAP for short. How this armor looks like? Well, we don't know, we can only speculate. However, here on the photograph we can see a prototype armor using depleted uranium alloy plates in a Nera style array with polycarbonate in between them as reactive layers. So this is perhaps one of the possible configurations of the heavy armor package. Other one that is possible is perhaps configured in a different manner, where Nira is still made from steel plates with some sort of polymer in between them, while depleted uranium alloy plates are encased in between steel plates, as it is often described, and placed behind Nira layers in place of in place or along steel ceramic steel layers. This uh, ratio between passive layers and reactive layers is changed in favor of the passive layers. Tanks with heavy armor package can be recognized by turret serial number, ending with a letter U, which can be seen on this photograph. Let's look at another photographs. These photographs present us uh, M1A2 prototypes being tested in 1992 at Fort Irwin National Training Center. Photographs are not of the best quality, but if we take a closer look, we can see not only a weight simulator plates on the turret front and turret roof, which is a reminder that M1A2 was meant to have a reinforced turret roof, but we can also see, again, a weight simulator plate welded to the hull front. This is evidence again suggesting that the whole front was reinforced. Here we can see a prototype of the M1A2 SEP V1. And again, we can see weight simulation plates on turret front, whole front, and also turret roof. So we can assume two major things. The turret front was reinforced, the whole front was reinforced, but also even with the M1A2 SEP V1, um, GDLS and US Army were still probably uh, playing with the idea of reinforced hull roof. I'm sorry, turret roof. Okay, let's move forward. And again, we have a prototype here. This is probably M1A2 SEP V2 prototype. And we can see these weight simulation plates again on the turret front, turret roof, and also hull front. And another photograph of the M1A2 SEP V2 prototype. This time with the Cross 2 remote weapon station. But we can again see weight simulation plates. We can assume that armor was adjusted on these tanks in various places during development. This is why plates have different size and placement. Another evidence that both turret and hull armor is being upgraded or replaced are photos from Joint Systems Manufacturing Center facility. Here we can see turret shells we can see that at least two turrets already went through armor replacement program. As we can see, fresh weld lines for external steel plates covering special armor modules. These external plates must be cut off and removed before special armor modules can be disassembled and replaced. This is also a good example of how modular armor of modern tanks is. In other words, all modern tanks is modular armor in one form or another. Oh, and here we have another photograph, being a hard evidence showing a replacement procedure of the whole front special armor package. We can see a GDLS employee cutting welds before exter external steel plates can be removed to provide access to the special armor module. So I think there is no better evidence here showing that the front hull armor of the M1 series 
is also being improved during the modernization uh, programs. Here's another document. The source might not be the best. However, it clearly suggests that at least M1A1s going through the AIM or Abrams Integrated Management Program got heavy armor package in both hull and the turret. We can also see that the M1A2 used second generation uh, HAP armor and M1A2 SEP uses third generation HAP armor. Here is another document showing a placement of the HAP armor in turret front and hull front. Although this specific document also claims that depleted uranium armor in hull front could only be found in five tanks at the moment when this document was written. However, here is another problematic issue. To what timeline this document can uh, could refer to? And perhaps it did not refer to the time when it was published. We can perhaps assume that the first generation HAP armor added DU layers only to the turret front when early M1A1 uh, HAs were produced from 87, 88 to 1990. In 1990, late production M1A1 HAs and new M1A1 HCs or heavy common variant for both US Army and US MC started to be produced. And these variants probably used new second generation HAP armor alongside M1A2 that got its production start few years later in 1992. Another interesting factor is that probably around 1990s M1 started to receive armor upgrade containing armor grade titanium alloy. This titanium Titanium alloy is used in main armor, but also as a new cover for the gunner primary site, new blow-off panels, and NBC protection system covers. Somewhere around 2010 or 2011, if my memory serves well, M1A1 SA and M1A2 SEP V2 tanks started to appear with a new uh, turret uh, serial numbers, ending with the letter M. This was confusing at the time, as new letters suggest a uh, new armor package. I was researching this subject and my conclusion is that this is a replacement for heavy armor package. In documents regarding uh, M1A2 SEP V3 development, it was often described as Next Generation Armor Package, or NGAP for short, or sometimes as Next Evolutionary Armor, or NIA for short. I will stick with NGAP as it is more consistent with other armor designations. What is important is that M1A2 SEP V3s also have two red serial, serial numbers ending with letter M. However, their turrets have physically thicker armor. What does that mean? Few things. It means that probably M1A1 SA and M1A2 SEP V2 tanks made from around 2010-2011 time period uses first generation of the new NGAP armor, while M1A2 SEP V3 uses even newer second generation NGAP armor. A short detour. Here on the photo we can see M1A2 SEP V2 that is integrated with Trophy HV Active Protection System. Uh, the radar and uh, interceptor modules on this tank are not installed. We only have armored boxes with electronics visible on the turret roof. You all probably noticed uh, a massive steel plate welded to its turret front. It was reported that Trophy HV, when installed, changes turret weight balance. Thus, when tank is standing on a specific slope, the gunner might have problems rotating the turret in a manual mode using hand cranks. Thus, these plates were added as a ballast. 
but if you add such plates, why not to make them from armor grade steel for additional protection as well? It's the only solution that makes sense. On the next slide, we can see a M1827 V3 prototype number four. And again, we can see massive weight simulation plates added to the turret and hull front, thus suggesting massive boost in protection of these zones when second generation NGAP armor is installed. We also have confirmation from various sources like uh, General Dynamics Land Systems officials speaking during AUSA or Association of the United States Army exhibition in 2015 confirming that both turret and hull received a completely new armor package. On this slide we can see two tanks. In tan camouflage we have M1A2 SEP V2 and in olive camouflage we have M1A2 SEP V3. Notice both have turret serial numbers ending with letter M. However, M1A2 SEP V3 have visibly thicker front turret armor. This is done probably for two purposes. First and obvious one is increase in armor protection. Second purpose is probably to integrate a proper ballast for turret when Trophy HV active protection system is installed. Solving the problems that M1A2 SEP V2s have and doing this in a more elegant way than it is done on M1A2 SEP V2s with ballast plates simply welded to the turret front. Another curious thing is this presentation I found many years ago, claiming that M1A1SA and M1A2 SEP V2 have both steel and cased deplete depleted uranium armor in frontal and turret side armor protection. First thing, notice how this phrase is constructed. It implies that frontal means both turret and hull frontal ar armor and separately turret side armor. Another issue is depleted uranium here because there is a deba deba uh, debate about possibility that depleted uranium is used or not used in the newest NGAP armor. Honestly, I can only say I do not know, and both possibilities are viable. And we fin finally came to the last slide. Here is a uh, made by me classification of various armor packages used by the M1 tanks in the arsenal of the United States Armed Forces. Obviously, there is a certain, probably even very, very large margin of error in my research. After all, majority of uh, data is simply classified and we can only speculate on this subject. So as you can see here, the M1 tank used BRL1 armor, M1 IP used BRL2, M1A2 used BRL2 or perhaps improved variant, M1A1HA early series used heavy armor package of the first generation, M1A1HA of the late series used the HAP of the second generation, same we can see in the M1A1HC, M1A1D, M1 A1 AIM V1 was uh, probably one of the first variants that used HAP of the second or the first generation in the A1 series. M1 A1 AIM V2, also known as the M1 A1 SA, uses either HAP of the first generation or the first generation NGAP armor. M1 A1 FEP, this is the USMC equivalent of the M1 A1 SA, either uses uh, second generation HAP or the third generation HAP because all M1A1 FEPs are upgraded M1A1 HCs or the basic M1A1s that were in the United States Marine Corps arsenal. The basic M1A2 used HAP of the second generation, the M1A2 SEP V3, uh, V1 used HAP of the first generation, of the third generation, I'm sorry. The M1A2 SEP V2 is the, the third generation HAP or uh, first generation NGAP. And M1A2 SEP V3 and the newest M1A2 SEP V4 that is in development uh, uses the second generation NGAP. Why the M1A2 SEP V4 uses second generation NGAP? Well, 
th there is no requirement for this newer variant to have better armor than the M1A2 SEP V3. However, everything is possible. And we need also to remember that uh, General Dynamics uh, Land Systems uh, officials, um, and if I am not wrong, it was also during the Association of the United States Army exhibition in 2015, they also claim that uh, they are working on the new turret for the M1 tank. So if this new turret will be developed, uh, we can assume that this tank will be designated as M1A3. And we can speculate that uh, perhaps the crew will be reduced to three men, so the loader will be replaced with the autoloader. Uh, perhaps uh, the tank will receive new gun. Everything is possible. So we will see. However, I hope my video clarified my many things and that it was interesting for you. So have a nice day and we will see each other in the next video.